I'm a sport and exercise physician from Sydney. I created this video to provide patients and other physicians with a better understanding of how a sport and exercise physician practices and serves their community. Many sport and exercise physicians enjoy the privilege of working in a team to help elite athletes achieve their goals. I guess what most GPs and other physicians and certainly many patients don't know is that the majority of our patients are everyday people with common musculoskeletal problems. For all ages and for all types of injury, both acute and chronic, we try to bring the same philosophy of management with it that we use with our elite athletes in terms of optimizing lifestyle factors to our patients. That includes looking after diet, exercise capacity, sleep, and mental health. Sports physicians fill the space between allied health treatment and surgical treatment for a range of problems. To summarize in one sentence, a sports physician looks after any patient who has a medical or musculoskeletal problem affecting their ability to maintain an active lifestyle. Now this most commonly includes a wide variety of conditions, arthritis, particularly osteoarthritis, acute injuries, tendon pain, fatigue, and head injuries. But patients and other specialists often enlist our help with exercise for their patients with cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other complex medical problems. So exercise prescription is becoming a bigger part of the role of the sports physician. One of the most common problems that limits exercise capacity in our society is osteoarthritis, or OA. And this particularly affects patients when it influences the hip and the knee. Over 4 million Australians live with OA, and the estimated costs are over $5.5 billion per year. Osteoarthritis is both an inflammatory and degenerative condition. It mostly affects the hands, hips and knees. Unfortunately, it seems to be increasing in its prevalence in younger patients who are not very good candidates for surgery, particularly joint replacement surgery. It's critical that all patients with OA understand how to manage their OA using evidence-based treatments and a lifestyle-based approach. And this is for both their quality of life and overall health. Because patients with OA can suffer fairly rapid downward spiral in their health outcomes outside of their musculoskeletal system. And we know that pain can lead to inactivity, weight gain, elevated insulin and glucose levels, increased inflammation, poor sleep, depression, poor food choices, more weight gain, and so on and so forth. And so left unchecked, this process can lead to derangements in metabolic health, with complications affecting the function of virtually every organ in the body. Now, there is one silver lining here. The pain a patient with OA experiences is a very strong motivator to make lifestyle changes before their health takes a big dive and affects them in other ways. Now, I've worked with countless patients with osteoarthritis who have had comorbid obesity, fatty liver disease, and insulin resistance, and these patients benefit greatly from weight loss, non-exacerbating exercise, and looking all after all of the other pillars of their health. The medical treatments that have the most evidence in managing osteoarthritis are mostly lifestyle-based, as we can see, with strengthening, biomechanical tools, weight loss and metabolic management up top of the, uh, of the options, where medications and topical gels seem to be uh, in this group as well. And as we move up the tiers, the, tr the evidence becomes thinner and less reliable for things like physical agents, hot packs and cold packs, nutraceuticals such as, cultures, uh, such as uh, glucosamine, and injectable adjuncts.
Let me run you through the process of comprehensive osteoarthritis management from a sports physician's perspective. First, during an initial consultation, we obtain comprehensive review of the patient's specific form of OA based on their history, examination and imaging. We then perform a comprehensive head-to-toe systemic examination to assess all the contributors to their pain and inflammation. Some patients require further tests, including blood tests to assess their hormonal, glycemic and inflammatory profile. And we target elevated insulin levels, which often drive the metabolic syndrome and are found to be higher in patients with osteoarthritis, even if they're not overweight. Now, with all this information, we're much better equipped to provide advice on lifestyle targeted at metabolic health and to reduce inflammation. And it's not just about weight loss for many of these patients. The non-scale factors like pain, inflammation, sleep quality and exercise capacity can make rapid improvements as well. And there are a number of ways we use to reduce insulin and body fat all whilst improving muscle mass. We go through in detail the science of the options and what works. Every patient is started on an exercise program that does not exacerbate their joint pain and a diet that reduces the inflammatory and insulin burden on the patient is prescribed with guidance and resources. Medications are reviewed and optimized to minimize harm and occasionally biomechanical tools are prescribed if malalignment problems exist and this is appropriate. If there is severe limitation and dysfunction, sometimes a corticosteroid injection is an appropriate first line option to help the patient head in the right direction. However, other injections might be appropriate if the essential treatments have been actioned first. Sport and exercise physicians often measure the outcomes as their patient use them at key time points in order to track the effects of treatment. And all of this is in the context of a patient's specific goals and their quality of life. In this day and age, we have more information and technology readily available than ever before to assist with health monitoring. Respiratory quotient testing, continuous glucose monitoring, ketone monitoring. These are just a couple of the tools that we can probably use to provide much more information than weight loss alone. These biofeedback tools allow patients to objectively monitor their own progress and individualize their diet and exercise accordingly. A major advantage of these tools is the education accountability and empowerment they give patients. And we certainly use these tools in elite sport, but they should be and can be accessible to our patients as well. Adjunctive tools like corticosteroid, PRP or hyaluronic acid injections should really be reserved for patients who have optimized all other aspects of their care or are really struggling because even though it takes very little effort on the patient's part and certainly the doctor's part, the effect size tends to be lower on average compared to exercise and diet. But when there is severe limitation of exercise capacity and inability to perform daily activities, a corticosteroid injection can be warranted to help a patient, allow a patient a window of opportunity with which to commence rehabilitation. PRP and hyaluronic acid injections do have a longer duration of action according to the research, but these studies are of limited quality. They do show up to nine months benefit. Acute injury management is an essential skill set for the sports physician. On-field injuries require a calm, well-prioritized immediate response. Sports physicians must maintain currency in their immediate medical skills in order to provide a safety net to both athletes, children and the general public. Anything from a shoulder dislocation to a spinal cord injury or even sudden cardiac death can occur on the sporting field and even during training. 
A major tool in the armory of the sports physician is point of care ultrasound. It's extremely valuable diagnostically and for procedures both on game day and in the clinic. As an example, this patient came to me with what was found to be a benign nerve sheath tumour called a schwannoma. And this is after he had failed surgery to release a muscle in his buttock to treat shooting pain travelling down his thigh. Now, this tumour was missed on the preoperative MRI uh, because it was between two different sequences and, and frankly was slightly difficult to see. But passing my ultrasound probe down the course of the nerve, it became very clear to me what was going on. This patient was so relieved to have an answer to his severe pain and has since had curative surgery and had the, uh, the nerve sheath tumour removed by a surgeon. So as you can see, ultrasound becomes an extension of clinical examination by allowing physicians just like myself to test hypotheses at the point of care and allow us to visualise moving tissues. PRP or platelet-rich plasma injections can also be helpful in a number of conditions. Sports physicians seem to be divided in their views of this treatment, with many remaining unconvinced of the evidence. The concept is that by extracting and concentrating platelets via a centrifuge and injecting this fraction of blood, there is a modulation of inflammation and pain that occurs, as well as stimulus of healing of the underlying injured tissue. And this is via signaling effects of those platelet cells on other cells in the area. PRP is safe and autologous, but does require judicious use in patients to select those most likely to be. Now here you can see an open water swimmer who had a small undersurface partial thickness tear of his subscapularis tendon, one of the main tendons that provides power during swimming and he was not responding to rehabilitation over a couple of months. Here you can see the needle entering from the side and, and filling the defect with PRP. Sports physicians commonly see patients with tendon pain. Now under normal conditions, they're much like biological springs or coils made up of very densely packed collagen fibers in both a parallel and helical arrangement. When patients have mechanical overload or, commonly, metabolic conditions that damage those tendons, there's a continuum of pathology that occurs from simple irritation all the way to degeneration. We're constantly trying to provide the right loading stimulus for the tendon capacity to increase in these conditions. But we also need to ensure we treat each specific athlete for their sport and the requirements on their tendon in that sport, as well as their related body parts. All of this needs to be provided with the right building blocks for recovery, so the right dietary intake. Now, not only does the tendon adapt, but the nervous system also adapts as we de-threaten it by providing graduated increased load. And what that looks like clinically is that the patient finds their pain more predictable and manageable in response to the exercises and the physical loading. Now this unfortunately takes a lot of time and patience. So patients do need to have trust in the process and their rehabilitator. Now while approximately 90% of patients improve with this approach and through an exercise or mechanotherapy based approach, a small number of patients will not improve after a six to eight week period. And in these cases, onward referral to a sport and exercise physician can be helpful to identify any snares in the road that might be blocking the path to recovery. When there's persistence of these symptoms, as I mentioned, there's often small blood vessels and nerves that travel with them growing into the tendon, and this can be seen on ultrasound. Now these vessels are thought to represent ingrowth that occurs adaptively into the tendon. And this unfortunately comes with those nerve endings, which is thought to contribute with, to the pain that, and sensitivity that does not resolve quickly. This is a 55 year old female patient who had ongoing mid portion Achilles pain. 
despite six weeks of dedicated rehabilitation of the physio. You can see she had a lot of these neo-vessels running through the back of the tendon, which we're now in cross-section looking at, and these were contributing to her pain. Now, this is a high-volume PRP injection, specifically designed to provide a stripping effect to the back of the Achilles tendon for both pain relief and also to provide the signaling growth factors peripherally to the tendon. Again, the PRP injections are not necessarily required to target the degenerative regions within the tendon to be effective, and therefore stripping injections might be more effective. Active patients can be at high risk of bone stress injuries, and it is nuanced in order to understand the specific injury patterns that occur in different sports, the specific types of risk of injury based on the fracture pattern, the recovery time, and also the, the means of preventing recurrence. There are many different types of stress fracture with different blood supplies. A worst case scenario can occur with an undiagnosed stress fracture of the neck of the femur in the hip. And this leads, unfortunately, to loss of blood flow to the ball that enters the socket, the femoral head. Now this is potentially devastating and can lead a young person to require a hip replacement. But whenever a fracture occurs with minimal trauma, it needs to raise the question about that patient's bone health in general. So a comprehensive medical workup is needed to exclude more severe underlying medical problems. And therefore, a sports physician can help identify this. If there's a relative deficit of energy after the body has used up all its energy on exercise and core functions, all of the other bodily functions to do with reproduction, bone health, mental health, gut health, and so on, can be compromised. Now, we call this relative energy deficiency in sport, and it is a very common presentation and occurs in both young women and young men. Sports physicians work very hard to communicate carefully with the patient about the diagnosis and very closely with sports dietitians, coaches and trainers so that our patients understand the importance of maintaining enough intake to support their energy requirements for activity and exercise. Fatigue in patients is a very common presentation and does require a comprehensive workup because there is a multitude of potential underlying medical causes requiring a wide skill set and a broad knowledge base. Most fatigue is actually benign and related to physiological adaptations that are required in order for the body to adapt to the workloads placed on it and become fitter. Now we call this the overload principle. It's normal to be tired and sore after you work hard to make your body stronger. But this can become non-functional over time. And now the majority of patients who complain of fatigue will have a common thread going through their life that often is described as an overcrowded lifestyle. Now there's no magic wand here, but the main goal coming from a sport and exercise physician's perspective is to exclude the severe medical conditions, be they respiratory, cardiac, psychological, and so on. And therefore, after we've done that, we can help a patient identify any imbalances, prioritize training, and effectively maintain a positive state of growth and adaptation. Now, overtraining syndrome is a maladaptive condition that can lead to weeks and even months of hormonal and neurological dysregulation. And the symptoms of fatigue can take a very long time to recover. This uh, triathlete came to see me regarding a stress fracture in his shin, and he had a very normal blood profile on his comprehensive workup. He turned out to suffer from a condition called exercise-induced asthma when he was tested with a spirometry uh, test, a, a specialised breathing test. And now he's on treatment and beating all of his personal bests. Sports physicians are at the forefront of concussion management 
and have been involved in every international consensus guideline since these began because of our experience with the point of care of concussion on field and our ability to interpret and critique the evidence around what works and what doesn't. Concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury leading to a transient state and a reversible state of neurological impairment. In other words, the brain doesn't work as well and the parts of the brain that don't work well vary between individuals. The major complexity of concussion is that there's no measurable structural damage. In fact, the only measurable Measurable change is a transient one and depends on uh, speaking to and examining a patient. So therefore, this is a functional disturbance and it's measured indirectly through comprehensive testing of all of the domains of a patient's brain function. Although the majority of cases appear to resolve pretty quickly within two weeks, the emerging long-term effects are certainly creating anxiety for parents, athletes and children involved in collision and contact sports. And so this requires clinicians to be very much up to date to ensure optimal care. We now know that a short period of relative rest combined with graduated exercise and activity seems to improve the physiological function of the uh, blood flow to the brain, and this seems to improve recovery. Now, Persistent concussion, concussion symptoms are also improved through this approach when performed carefully. Our job as sport and exercise physicians is again to identify any concerning medical problems that may be underlying a patient's symptoms after they have a concussion, particularly persistent symptoms, but also to help guide and direct where rehabilitation should be targeted, what domains of neurological function uh, whether it's the neck, whether there are components of balance or imbalance occurring for that patient, and so on. And prescribing exercise is becoming a greater uh, facet of our management of concussion after a short period of rest. So you can see on the bottom right here, there are a number of steps separated by milestones of recovery and assessment of being symptom-free. And now, the guidelines that are most up to date for concussion at the moment have outlined that a minimum of five stages of gradual return should be taken from the time the patient feels normal before they go back to an at-risk contact sport, for example. And this is the reason that a stepwise approach taking about five days should be required prior to a patient return, returning to sport after a head injury even if they say their symptoms have gone away. We can see here that tests of computerized uh, neurological function, what we call neurocognitive tests, have shown that at the seven day period, a full 20% of athletes still had neurocognitive impairment from their baseline test, despite resolution of their symptoms. And so all of the other tests were normalized at this time. And while we have no way of directly measuring brain function at this stage, this is good evidence that, that at least another four or five days should be provided to recover functionally, despite the patient feeling normal. Now, a return to contact sport is associated with a higher risk of both concussion and more prolonged recovery and other injuries. So although a, pa a patient or child might say they feel fine, this graduated return process gives them the best chance of a full recovery. So as you can see, a sport and exercise physician treats a wide variety of medical, surgical, and also musculoskeletal problems in a wide variety of patients. In fact, anything that affects a person's ability to maintain an active lifestyle. I hope you found this video useful. I create these educational videos to help empower patients by allowing them to understand their problem, treatment options, and the expected recovery. Please remember this lecture is for educational purposes only, does not constitute the giving of medical advice, and no patient-doctor relationship is formed.